Um, and thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, we want it to be an interactive session, so uh, we have a chat box uh, on the screen. It's just next uh, up at the top right-hand side. So feel free to use that as much or as little as you want, and do feel free to put some questions uh, in there also. Uh, but we're going to do some introductions around uh, Cecilia and myself so you can find out a little bit more of who we are. Uh, but before we do kick off, let's let's see where everyone's dotted around the world. So please just feel free in the chat to put uh, maybe your nearest city or the town that you currently live in. Uh, and I will uh, kick us off. So we've got London uh, to begin with here. And then oh, we've got Cecilia up in Liverpool, of course. Uh, so let's do some intros whilst people are populating uh, the chat with where they are from. So um, I'm based in London, and I'm the Director of Strategy and Growth for here at, at Improco Learning. I've been in the learning consultancy space for around about 15, 16 years now, uh, led many global projects with large organizations and also smaller organizations as well, predominantly all focused on helping humans and people uh, perform better in businesses and helping then the knock-on effect of that organization perform uh, to a higher state as well. And onboarding is something that's been incredibly close to my heart and also to Cecilia's heart throughout our careers. And we see it really as that fundamental element of growth within any organization. And some interesting stats that we're gonna go through as a course of this, uh, this uh, workshop. But one of the key ones is the amount of people that are quiet quitting organizations. Globally, it's costing around about $3 billion in terms of people just not really partaking in an organization, not really enjoying what they do. And they're seeing high attrition in that period of time of around about six to 12 weeks from when people start in a business as well. So they have a poor onboarding experience. And then if they do stay in the business, they kind of stay in there, but don't perform to their full potential. And it's costing, it's costing the organization, it's costing uh, the business heaps in terms of lost productivity and money. So we've worked uh, to develop some practical tools and techniques and uh, insights uh, to help you understand how you can also potentially transform your onboarding experiences. Uh, but Cecilia, let's hand over to you to do an introduction from yourself and uh, find out some of your background. Thank you, Lee. So yes, I'm Cecilia. I'm a Learn, principal learning experiences uh, architect here at Infopro Learning. I've been in the world of learning and development for over 15 years as well, in consultancy for about five. And like you said, Lee, onboarding is, is very close to my heart. I delivered many onboarding campaigns over the years, and it's, it's a great way to introduce people to your company, to your culture, to really set the tone for their journey. So a great onboarding has many, many benefits that we'll go over over the next hour or so. So yes. Awesome, thank you. So without any further ado, let's actually get started and uh, begin exploring some of these important topics. So where we kind of want to start with is how we've seen this transition from many, many years ago with the industrial revolution where everything was about building, developing, growing, starting from scratch in terms of global uh, economies, really. We're now seeing this transition from an industrial revolution to something that's been coined the cognitive revolution. The sort of, I guess, um, more prevalence of things like AI, which has always been around, but it's becoming more prevalent, it's becoming more accessible, particularly with the generative AI. People are finding information quicker. People are accessing information quicker. People in organizations are finding out what's happening in that business before, often before uh, anybody in that business even knows or should know. So there's becoming this time where how people think, how people operate, what their expectations and demands are is gradually transitioning. And it is a revolution because of the rate of change that's happening. It's constantly changing. If you attend any L&D event, say last year versus this year or two years ago versus this year, what people are talking about is constantly evolving and it goes through these cycles. But one of the things that we've really recognized is that the human element of all of these solutions is still there. 
And when it comes to onboarding, people still want to feel that human connection to an organization. People still want to feel that human connection to others as part of that onboarding program. So it's not just about make it digital overnight, let's make it accessible to everybody overnight, but it's how do we transform these programs to, to satisfy the cognitive needs of people moving forwards, but that also recognize their individual needs, expectations. We know the different generations that operate within workforces, so it's no mean feat to begin to look at how to transform organizations. But we're going to focus on a few key things in this in this session around the framework of what successful onboarding can look like. We're going to look at the personalization element and how to bring personalization in to learning, but then also considering the performance side of things as well and how the structure, the personalization and the cognitive revolution that's happening can all lead to an incremental performance increase stemming from onboarding. And when we see what's going out there, going on out in the world, it's huge. And these are some really big numbers. And I won't go through these numbers, but it paints a pretty stark picture. Now, this isn't a stark picture of demise and uh, the end of everything as we know it. It's a revolution in terms of how things are shifting and how things are changing. And if you look at that quote at the bottom from the future of work from IDC, by 2026, 90% of organizations will face skills gaps. They will face skills gaps because the skills required tomorrow are not the skills that people are being trained on today. So it's really important when we think about the needs and expectations of people coming into organizations now, how do we set, set them up to perform and perform well now and also into the future as well? What are some of those skills? How is this gonna transition? How are we gonna make sure that the investment we make today in terms of our programs and our onboarding and our solutions is gonna set us up for success in the future? So this is really about opening our eyes to the fact that when we're considering our onboarding programs, how are we making sure that we're thinking about the skills needed in the future to be able to satisfy the needs of individuals and also uh, the organization as a whole? And the importance of doing this really is, is threefold. There are of course business outcomes. There are of course people outcomes. But when we think about this environment, socioeconomic, global, organizational wise that we're in right now, innovation is fundamentally important. Now innovation isn't coming up with the next big thing as I'm sure many of you will be aware, but innovation is sometimes about how do we evolve what we do? Innovation is also thinking about the skills that exist today and considering how those skills will need to be mapped and transitioned in the future. If we don't innovate when it comes to our onboarding programs, we end up with something that just doesn't deliver the results, or we end up doing things to it which look great, sound great, get some good uh, results from people, but then you're doing the same thing again in a year's time because of the rate of change. So feeding in innovation, feeding in this curious mind into how we develop our onboarding programs is a fundamental uh, element. Cecilia, people have heard my voice drone on a little bit there and, and talk about some of those some of those facts and figures. What are some of your thoughts around the importance of, of why people should focus on transforming their onboarding programs? Yes, Lee, uh, onboarding is, is really crucial to employee engagement, and that's something that mm. I'm really passionate about. So when mm -hmm. you look at retention, job satisfaction, morale, all these things can come from onboarding. If you give people a really long and complex onboarding program, they will be mm. overwhelmed. So what we've seen over the years is that by reassessing your onboarding, thinking what's crucial now, what can wait until later, how can we give people the tools to become more autonomous? Mm. We see more empowerment and a reduction in attrition, which is uh, a massive business impact. In some cases of up to almost 50% during training time. So that's, that's a massive save for any business. Mm. 
uh, you also want to give people the culture from the beginning and make sure that they are aligned with your organizational objectives, your standards. You want them to become efficient. Uh, so we can do this by transforming your onboarding and we can see an increase of about 35% in efficiencies. Mm. Again, reducing training time scales can have a, a big impact on, on your return on investment. We've seen this, reducing it by just a week uh, can really boost your investment and you can see a return of about 300% in some cases. So that's, that's a mm. really um, tangible financial outcome for a business. The Absolutely. other thing with onboarding is we have, especially for some uh, entry level jobs, we have a candidate driven market. And when we talk about this, what do we mean by this? It's more than just a buzzword. It's about loyalty. Gone are the days when people used to join a company and stay for 30 years, right? People have options. We have uh, global and internal mobility. People have the opportunity to, to apply for other jobs, to move around, to work remotely. It's tempting. Applying for jobs has never been easier. Everyone's got access to the technology to apply for jobs. So you really want to make sure that the people who have gone through your recruitment process stay engaged, have a great onboarding experience and stay with the business for as long as possible. That's what you're yeah. looking for from your onboarding. Mm, absolutely. And, and I think everybody sitting in and, and watching this or watching a recording back will probably echo that as well, right? You know, when people bring in new joiners to a business, they don't bring those people in with the expectation that they're going to be gone in a few months time or, or gone in a, in a year's time, unless they're on like a short term contract, of course, but typically if they're not, they want these people in the business for a long time. They're investing in everything uh, that they can to set this person up for, for success. We're going to move on to talk about the architecture framework that we've seen work really well. And we're going to share that with some folks. But what I'd love to do is kind of focus on, to begin with, what are some of the pitfalls that you've identified that it, when it comes to how uh, onboarding programs are currently structured? So actually, the structure itself is not setting that program up for success. What, what, what have you seen and identified as unhelpful elements in that space? Yes, yeah, so over the years, what I've seen is trying to give people too much information in one go. That's one of the biggest mm. pitfalls in my experience, trying to cover absolutely every eventuality when people are familiarizing themselves with so many different things. It mm. can be a little bit counterproductive. Mm -hmm. So by really targeting the areas that are your main drivers for your business mm. and then giving people, we're, we're going to talk about this as well, but giving people time to to really apply the knowledge and then grow from from then mm. onwards, that's proven really successful in the past when we've uh, done onboarding transformation. Mm. It's more Absolutely. than just covering, you know, the the compliance elements and making it a bit of a tick box exercise. You really need to focus mm. on what what your customers want. How can we address those needs and just flip the journey? Mm. Definitely. Really, really interesting. And I think it's a good point around the main drivers as well, because uh, when I led learning teams in, in Volkswagen and, and TUI, the induction, as it was called then on board, is a bit more of a fancy word for it this day, but it was called the induction program. And what I often found is I'd have people from all around the business coming to me and saying, can we include this in the induction? Uh, this is going to be really important for people to know. And before you knew it, you ended up with a program that had about 4 million different slide decks in it and trainers just kind of rolling out other people's messages, you know, and, and obviously this was before the sort of explosion of mixed modality in terms of e-learning and videos and other ways of doing it. So it was all a bit human led and, and facilitator led, but we still see some of that happening today, right? We still see onboarding programs becoming a, uh, a, a a comms channel for different parts of the organization and it's it's it, it shifted focus from being something that's actually why why does why is somebody learning this piece of information going to be why is that going to be helpful for them in their role 
And it shifted from that to actually, this is what they need to know. We don't care what they know. This is what we as a business want to tell them. And, and that's not through anybody's ill intent and going, we just want to bombard people with lots of information. To a certain degree, it's, it's probably the best of intentions that have created this problem, right? Yes, everything's important, but what's the most relevant elements at this point in time mm. and what are things that can be picked up later down the line when people mm -hmm. are a bit more settled? I've seen people come out of, of onboarding and, and taking a call, for example, in a contact centre and forgetting their name, forgetting how to introduce themselves because mm. there was so much information that was shared mm. that it, it can be really overwhelming. And, yeah. and a bit frightening for, for new starters. So by sure. really breaking it into small chunks and, and focusing on relevance uh, and yeah, and how often they're gonna be using those things. Everything's important, right? And all mm. the elements of onboarding are going to be um, ingredients for their success in the business. It's just Absolutely. about what we need to focus on first. Absolutely. Um, and. The folks watching and, 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 and listening in live, uh, I can't see the participant chat, but Cecilia can. And feel free to throw in any of your questions or even your horror stories uh, when it comes to onboarding training. Um, and and we'll, we'll call some of those out and discuss some of those. But it's not Halloween yet, so we're perhaps going to move away from the uh, from the horror stories and now start to look ahead and say, actually, what have we seen as some of the good ways to uh, develop onboarding programs and transform onboarding programs? So let me uh, let me flash something up for you, which is going to be the architecture framework. Now, I don't know who said it, but somebody said the ones that three elements or three pieces of information is is often the best thing. If there are two steps, it doesn't feel very important and too simplistic. If there are four steps, it's too complicated. So as you would expect, there are three steps from a high level framework. And the three steps are very, very straightforward. Learn, embed, sustain. Now, if we're thinking about an onboarding program, the first element we want to be considering is what is it that people need to learn? Now, we're not talking personalization just yet, but personalization also plays a part in this because if people have gone through a recruitment process, they've had psychometrics, they've had job interviews, they've met senior leaders or frontline leaders, they've met with recruitment, HR, they've had their CV analyzed, they've perhaps done situational uh, assessments to assess their competencies of dealing with different things. They've kind of laid it all out for you. They then join the business and all of that stuff is kind of like left out there. Okay, great, you've got the job. Now, thank you for all your previous experience. We're gonna tell you how we do it here. So almost that stuff from before becomes a little bit null and void. It clearly helps them internally, but the program itself doesn't align to the experience that they brought with them. That's the personalization bit we will uh, touch on and, and, and share some thoughts on. But ultimately, this learn element is a hard focus on the knowledge that needs to be transferred. And being really ruthless with yourselves to say, from a learn perspective, this isn't going to be about skills practice. This is pure knowledge. What do people need to be learning? How do we get this knowledge across to them in the right way? So some of the things you know that we will consider um, their previous experience, how they take in information, their learning styles, the job role that they're going into, is it front office, back office, front line, senior, uh, middle management, wh where do they sit within the organization and how does that knowledge need to align to that? And then when we think about embedding that knowledge, this is then the ability for them to be able to interpret what they've learned and those practical applications. So within the onboarding program, so this morning, as an example, might be a learn morning. So we're going to focus on some knowledge transfer. It's self-directed, perhaps, as an example, you might want to choose. So you need to go and learn this information and come back to the embed session competent. 
the competence obviously is one element and proven perhaps by an assessment. So it's a demonstration that their knowledge has achieved a certain standard or that their ability to remember information has achieved a certain standard. The embed part is now about how do I take what I've learned and be able to articulate that in a real world situation. So these practical applications could be dealing with even real life customers. Imagine bringing somebody in, in a contact center example, bringing somebody into a contact center, day three, they're talking live to a customer with support to help put some of that knowledge into practice. But actually, you don't often see that. You see people not until three weeks and then going into a mentoring pool and then shadowing somebody. So you're talking almost five, six weeks before somebody even starts to demonstrate productivity to that organization. Now, within that embed element, there's an important population of people that need to be brought in and need to be able to support what's happening at that point, and that is the line managers. And the L&D teams in the business need to be setting those line managers up for success in terms of what information do we need to be providing the line managers with to enable them to embed this learning further. Quick quizzes, as an example, quick coaching sessions. If we've got an LMS LXP, using some nudge uh, questions in there, one or two questions a day to test people's knowledge and just apply that in reality. Maybe some practical sessions, some demos. So really enabling that two-way discussion around embed. And then the final stage, which isn't a linear process of tick, 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 these can navigate back and forward, is sustain. <clears throat> so the evolution of that knowledge practice. Those of you uh, who are out there and understand the principles of experimentation uh, and test and learn, this is ultimately what we're talking about within this sustain page, uh, sustain stage rather. It's the ability for people to then begin experimenting and finding their own rhythm and their own skills, um, way of performing to apply it to their role. Now, this is where sustaining performance, sustaining confidence and sustaining competence extends over a long period of time. And what I often say is that onboarding never truly ends when people join an organization and it shouldn't really end. This sustaining part is then what does the learning portfolio look like? What does the capability framework and matrix look like? What does our talent development program look like in terms of sustaining this knowledge and building this knowledge even further? If I'm a frontline first job joining an onboarding program and my learn and knowledge transfer is fundamental elements of say communication skills, by the time I'm getting to this sustain point, I wanna be able to articulate the empowerment dynamic. I wanna be able to articulate how EI plays a crucial role in the uh, customer experience. So it's that evolution of the knowledge through practice and through experimentation uh, that's really important to be thinking about. So this is a high level framework. And these are almost the guiding principles, if you like, that we need to be thinking about there's often an accusation from business leaders to L&D of L&D are often tone deaf to the financial needs or constraints of our organization. Now, if you can connect each of these stages with the ability to be able to demonstrate business outcomes and results, you're on road to success. The learning element, I guarantee, and we do this for many of our clients initially, we do a discovery stage where we use learning bed sustain, we look at the current program, we align and map it to how it would fit against learning, uh, learning bed sustain. And we see a majority of the content that's currently in there, not critical or even not even mediumly critical to their job role within the first six months. So why are we training people on stuff that they're perhaps not gonna use? There's a compliance element that kicks in. So we reformat how that looks. You can reformat the trajectory of that learning. And actually you then start to see people can perform quicker. People can start to be productively live in your organization quicker, and it starts to achieve those results. Cecilia, just, just bringing you in um, on, on that point around learning bed sustain, 
what have been some of your experiences around how important it is to kind of have this focus of continuous learning within a onboarding but also b setting people up for success in terms of how that then translates into their real jobs yes i was i was hearing you lee and i was smiling because you said uh, <laughs> onboarding never truly ends and mm. one of the questions that we've got in in the chat from kevin uh, ah. is what is our take on the more recent trend of ever boarding and i i'd say you know we're fans mm. yeah <laughs> we're, we're definitely into that uh because when do you really truly learn to do your job mm -hmm. to every every degree you're always learning new things we're always mm -hmm. evolving jobs are dynamic uh the demands from our clients and customers evolve as well yep. so we need to be up to date technology is evolving so we never really stop learning uh, and I think anyone who's passionate about learning like we are would probably uh, agree with that statement. Mm. So again, it depends on, on yeah. what you see as onboarding. How do you measure that stage? Do you take mm. pre-boarding into consideration? Does onboarding end when, you know, after one week of induction training or three weeks or five weeks, or do you extend it to uh, probation period, or do you consider the first year, the first two years? So I think there's different interpretations of you know what people see as as the onboarding period. So mm. everboarding sounds like a, like a very much aligned with a sustained uh, mentality. That really you need to continue to apply mm. the knowledge, the learning, and increase it over time. Build on what you've got. Set the foundations right in the in the learn stages uh, yeah. and then grow from there so working with your leaders working with your peers uh, and yes always being a bit curious about how you can do things differently mm. and i think i think that's a really important point and it's a great point to share from from the chat as well in terms of of course you, you can't necessarily maintain the intensity of the learning and practice that you maybe have within your first few weeks but often what people feel is they kind of have all that focus all that attention some of that love through those first few critical weeks <clears throat> and then it almost falls off a cliff it's like right you've had your training get on with it good luck godspeed see you in six months at a one-to-one -one. And so no wonder people then kind of feel like, oh, okay, I'm now sort of a lone wolf and going out and, and, and making my own life for myself. And L&D &T, and teams, you know, that I speak with and, and ones that we've worked with develop portfolios, they develop line manager programs, but they're almost seen as these elective elements that you can pick and choose and people don't really understand where their where their learning sits. Do I need to learn that? No, I'm good at that. I'm all right. I can communicate. I know my own name and I can talk on a camera and talk to a customer. I'm fine. And so people struggle to articulate what their needs are. But if that is connected to the onboarding program through that learning bed stain, sustain uh, framework, then people are not going to fall off that cliff, right? They're not going to finish after a couple of weeks and go, oh, well, that's that then, I'm back to my day job. But also, as we said about in the embed stage, the line managers are enabled to continually grow and, and develop their individuals as well. So then the onus comes on those people. And if there's anybody out there that's thinking, yeah, Lee, this all sounds great, but our people are already incredibly busy. How on earth are line managers going to have time to be able to do this sort of stuff? The reality is these things are not huge time consumers if you do them right. If we're saying to line managers, they need to just know what the program outcomes are. And here's some questions over the first two weeks that they're going to have to ask. But if we also connect that to performance, using the contact center again as an example, just because it's top of head, if we're talking about a sales team in a contact center and we're talking about average order value, and you're bringing in some new salespeople because one of your biggest struggles is that your order value is quite low. So you need to increase your AOV, your average order value. 
if we're then able to connect the fact that actually just by encouraging the line manager to have more little focused questions with their team members that are joining that team, perhaps around what are our top three selling uh, upsell elements that you can mention? If a customer's buying X, what would be the number one upsell element that we've done in the past for that, that product? If a customer gives you an objection and says, no, how would you overcome that using our objection handling framework? <clears throat> if the line manager can just ask those questions within the space of one minute, 60 seconds, and that person's knowledge has been reinvigorated, they're repracticing that information and they can use it on their next conversation. They can use it on their next uh, discussion. And if it's a back office team, as an example, a complaint handling team for a uh, organization and people are writing letters or writing email responses back and somebody's struggling with something or they're new into that team, if somebody was to say, what would be our standard framework for sending an email response back to a customer with a, uh, an issue about pricing? Uh, it would be these 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 three stages of da, da, da. great yeah, that really demonstrates that that ever boarding element doesn't finish but it also proves the point that line managers with the right support from lnd and the right information from lnd can also embed and sustain that learning further and Absolutely. we're going to discuss some more of this little these little elements and um, Cecilia's got, got some great thoughts on how this looks in, um, in, in practice as well. So let me just uh, bring that up. Oh, I'd stop sharing. There we are. Um, so how do we maximize this? So thinking about the high-level framework that we discussed, this learn, embed, sustain. I'll use a food analogy because I have this type of physique that doesn't really uh, demonstrate that I eat salad that much so I enjoy I enjoy my food if learning bed sustain is the dish that's what we're creating then these three components here are the ingredients this is what goes into it and ideally you know we've got brain food on there I don't think anybody really wants to eat brains but anyway the, the first one is around content and the first one being these knowledge shots these need to be short bursts of information. If somebody's learning a process, if somebody's learning about a compliance way of doing something, if somebody's learning a sales process, a customer experience journey, anything that is knowledge sits in this space. And you'll see at the bottom, we've put it's devoid of skills practice. So you really have to challenge yourself to go, if I'm writing this piece of content or when we as an organization write digital modules, bite-sized modules, or even human-led virtual classroom sessions or in-person sessions, we really hold back on the skills practice element. And we're very clear on that for people. So when they're coming into a session in a virtual uh, classroom, as an example, this is a knowledge shop. We're gonna spend 20 minutes together. It's a transfer of information there'll be a quiz and a competency-based thing on the back of it. And then there's gonna be some key recommendations of things you do between now and our next session. The next session is in a skill shot. The skill shot is now the practice bit. This is where we perhaps use some scenarios. We perhaps use some uh, system simulations if we're training out systems. We perhaps use some AI uh, through our app of the AI chatbot and other organizations out there where people can interact with an AI system to be able to practice objection handling skills, pitching skills, or any other uh, things like coaching as an example. But these are also short bursts. And then the final element is the brain food. This almost becomes the, if you would like to, element, because we recognize the more curious person out there who perhaps, if we've been looking at coaching, the knowledge shop, will be the coaching framework. Learn it, know it, know it inside out, write it without thinking, good. Skill shots, hold a coaching conversation, using that framework to get the right outcomes for the individual, nailed it. The brain food element is then actually, where did that coaching framework come from? Who made that? What are some of the different ones out there? How do I build my own questions into this framework? So the brain food is more reflective, deeper content. And you might find this is more curated content. So here's a TED talk, 
here's a, uh, a, a learning journal to take a read of. Here's an article in a newspaper or whatever. So this is more of the information that people could read. And then if we kind of translate that to some of the things that our clients have done, is then you can almost have these leaderboards of learners. And uh, my son is seven years old and they measure now this one thing. And those of you with, with young children will probably know this attitude to learning. And attitude to learning is a real big thing. And if inside an organization, you're thinking of everybody being talent, attitude to learning could really be demonstrated by someone's ability to want to learn more in terms of brain food. The higher intake that they've got on their brain food scores, actually the, that person could be future talent. That person perhaps is saying to you, I love to learn, I like to know more, I like to reflect on more of this information, therefore I might be good in this organization. And of course it's taken in context of, in the context of the knowledge and the skills and the performance and everything else, but it's a good indicator to that attitude uh, of learning. Uh, Cecilia, some, some examples uh, from you would, would be great here of, of some of the things um, that you've done in the past that have really helped break them down into these sort of key elements, how you focus on this structure to really set onboarding programs up for, for success. What insights and thoughts do you have on that? Yes, I've got some to share, but before I do, I'd like to uh, go back to one of the questions from the chat. We've got a question from Maybe. Jenna about uh, ways in which we as learning leaders and onboarding specialists can set up our programs to improve time to utilization for billable resources. And mm -hmm. I think, and I hope that uh, everything you've been sharing for the last few minutes uh, gives you a bit of an insight into different ways of setting up your programs to improve that time to competency so that then you can get a return from your billable resources quicker. Mm. So that's definitely something that we've done before. And like, like you were saying, Lee, um, I really wanted to focus uh, on the attitude to learning because that's something that we, we often uh, in onboarding programs, some people come with, you know, they are already very motivated. They're joining a new company and they they don't see it as a, as a stepping stone. They see it as a career prospect. So attitude to learning can really show uh, self-awareness, growth mindset, all these great things that when you're thinking of future talent, you should be focusing on. So, mm -hmm. so I started from the end there, but um, that was a thought that I had when you were sharing that. Um, so ways in which we can do this, we try to focus on imparting the knowledge. There are different ways in which we have done this in the past. Uh, we find that there's, um, there's things that they can do uh, self-led in, in terms of uh, digital learning that they can do. They can also attend facilitated sessions, like I said, face-to-face -face or virtually. And then we set up the practice time and give them time to, again, embed that knowledge um, through practice. Um, and yeah, and then we move on to, you know, giving them further options and giving them tools to expand that knowledge if they wish to. And we see uh, there's an interest, there's an appetite, going back to the, to the food analogy, there's definitely an appetite when we deliver programs and people will come to us and say, you know, I was really interested in this topic, where can I learn more? So we're already giving them uh, the opportunity to explore further. And there are so many resources available uh, to, to people. It's about curating the best bits and the ones that are the most relevant to that company and, and the culture as well. Because I think with onboarding, there's uh, a big element of personalization and making it you know, bespoke to that business. Onboarding is not really a one size fits all. Uh, it's very much about learning about the particular role, about the company culture, the values, and the objectives that you want to achieve. So, so yeah, that's one of the things that I enjoy the most about creating an onboarding program. It's about understanding uh, the company culture and mm. then trying to to make sure that this is um, weaving it through the program. So it doesn't become a one day of you know learn about us. It becomes more of a of a mindset change. Mm. Mm. Absolutely, and I think that mindset point is 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 really really important. Just thinking about what that looks like in in practice, because I want to zone in a little bit on the personalization element. <clears throat> because we see the personalization 
as um, being quite important. And I think firstly, let's think about personalization in, in, in two lenses. The first one is personalization to the individual and their experience. The second part or the second lens is personalization to the organization and to their role that they're going to be doing. Now, if you can do both things, amazing. But the reality is you're probably not going to be able to do both of those things at the same time because something like personalization to their experience and their past is going to require reformatting of potentially recruitment and the way we capture data. It's going to require the reformatting of the technology that's used as part of the onboarding program, because if people's uh, current skills and capabilities is going to be positioned into the onboarding program, that onboarding program is going to look very different uh, for Bob as it will for Sandra. Uh, Bob and Sandra, just the names that came to my mind. But actually what you're going to end up with is somebody having an onboarding program that's two weeks and somebody else who's having an onboarding program that's six weeks and a business can't run like that. Now, we don't have the answer to what that looks like yet. We're exploring that, and we'd love to explore it with anybody that's on this call in terms of how do you generate a truly personal onboarding program whilst also protecting the operational effectiveness that's needed from the organization? Question mark. So then the second part is around the personalization of the content and the learning and the program toward the job role that, that person's going to be doing. Now, this also requires the skills. And Cecilia, we'll, we'll pick your brains on it in a second in terms of what you've seen work really well from a personalization perspective. Uh, but what we just want to share with you really quickly is actually the complexity of understanding the skills needed. Now, remember from the beginning, we also spoke about the fact that skills today are transforming in terms of the skills that are going to be needed tomorrow. So we need to also be thinking about what we're looking at here is also going to transform. So what would that look like today and what would that look like tomorrow? And how do we plan that trajectory in? And if we start to delve into this from a macro to micro uh, level, this is our skills framework that we uh, have developed. And if we look at it from this very high level industry perspective. We're going to focus in on one industry at the minute. We're going to look at electronics as an example. If we then take the next level down from that industry and look at the business, what does that um, uh, business do? Let's have a look in the business area of human resources as an example. We then focus in within the human resources and then we have all of the functions within the human resources section. And then we're going to look at uh, compensation and benefits. Who doesn't love that part of HR. And then we go into the job roles within that. Let's have a look at a benefits analysis. Uh, uh, sorry, that's where the dot was, a compensation consultant. And then within the compensation consultant is a bunch of skills that are needed. We've got regulatory knowledge that's needed from that perspective. So already you can start to see that if we begin mapping the skills that are needed, and personalize the onboarding program to both the industry, the business, the function, the role, and then the skills that are required. It can be a very uh, detailed, but also incredibly valuable uh, process. Now, if you was to kind of, if you were working in a HR function and you were looking at some training, uh, an onboarding program for the compensation and benefits team within that, and you were bringing on board a new compensation consultant, Recruitment might have looked at all of these elements, but actually does the onboarding program help with some of these things? Does it help with problem solving? Does it help with project management? Does it help with financial acumen? Does it help with analytical skills? Or is the onboarding program just basically telling them how we work, the things that they need to know and achieve all of your regulatory knowledge? Good, now, day one in the, in the real job, this is how we do it. So actually what we're saying is you need to be also cognizant of the fact of the skills that are required and delve into those skills and map those skills to the program. Now, when you align this also to then learning bed sustain and the knowledge shots, skill shots and brain food, you can then start to think about, well, what's important for people to know straight off? Actually, is it going to be important for them to be focused on interpersonal skills or networking? 
perhaps not within their first two weeks. So that's not necessarily going to be an upfront piece of knowledge or content or skills. That's going to be something that's part of their, to quote what was mentioned in the chat, part of their everboarding. So actually in week eight, they're going to get some interpersonal skills training. Problem solving, yeah, that's, that's quite important. We've got a backlog of 150 complaints from everybody around the business telling us how our benefits are shocking. So they need their problem solving done real quick. So really understanding the skills makeup required and also thinking ahead to the future, don't forget that. And then aligning that to the onboarding program is incredibly powerful. It's incredibly powerful as, a, as an exercise to be able to, uh, to focus on. And that's something we do regularly as an organization, um, but it's also something that you can be thinking about and starting to consider. And that really plays to this point around the second lens I mentioned of the personalization to the role that that individual is doing. Cecilia, in some of your projects and experiences that you've worked on, how have you seen what has been the benefit of being able to interpret that personalization of the job role that that person's going into to the onboarding program? So yes, personalization starts uh, in our discovery phase and it's about uh, speaking with different stakeholders in the business, understanding who the audience is, that's crucial because not every uh, onboarded person will perform the same roles. So having that understanding mm. of what the business needs, that's the beginning. Then we go into the skills, like you were saying, which skills are crucial now uh which ones mm -hmm. are important for the future how many uh, of those skills can be built on different levels of complexity can we start with like basic communication and then go into more like complaint handling a little bit more mm. elevated um mm. then the other thing that's proven quite successful in in my experience is having a modular approach so people mm -hmm. can complete modules uh in different stages so again if you've got a catalogue of different modules, you can almost cover what you were saying before about making the journey um, more in line with the experience that the new hire already brings, right? Mm. So they might be mm. able to, to be signed off some modules based on the experience that they already have and focus on the ones that are more relevant to their any skill gaps that they might have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, that helps with customization to the learner as, as much as to the organization. Mm. So this has proven really successful, having the modular approach, making it again in small or smaller chunks rather than doing a really long program in one go. Uh, and then building on those skills and continuing with that embedding and sustaining element uh, just to, to make the experience uh, and, uh, and the other element, actually, that I wanted to add in terms of the mm. modular approach is that also when it comes to um, looking at sustainability as well, when you're looking at changes in the future, changing modules is always a lot easier than changing the whole program. So then mm. you focus on the elements uh, that you want to adapt moving forwards if there's any changes within the business or, or the economic landscape or anything that's um, impacting the onboarding. Mm. Absolutely. And then thinking in terms of some other elements of, you, you mentioned customization there as well. How have you seen customization, say, of content within onboarding program play dividend to great results in the sense of actually you've had this fairly generic information that people have been learning. We've now customized it to this role and to this business, look at the difference it's making. What, what have you seen as, as some of the, the benefits of that and, and why that's there? One of the benefits is using uh, customer personas and that way mm. you can see who you're going to be interacting with. You're preparing people for uh, any future engagements with customers. So you draw from your data, who are the people who contact you, then you create uh, these roles and you involve them and, and it's about keeping them as um, present as possible and mm. trying to build those personas over time so that you can develop those emotional connections as well so mm. you are not just focusing on the processes but you're also focusing on the people skills that need to come with the job as well mm. absolutely i think that's really important as well 
Um, okay, so we're going into our last uh, last few minutes of, of this session. That's gone incredibly fast. Look at that, seven minutes already. Um, so while I talk about the next bit, I just want to invite anybody with any questions to pop them into the chat and we'll have a look at those those questions and, and discuss some of them here and now, or if we can't um, uh, share some of the information post the session. But Cecilia, any, any burning questions sitting in there just now? Uh, I'm just looking at uh, Malgor Sata's question. I hope I have pronounced your name properly uh, about tips on the shape of the onboarding process for a small fluctuation. And I, I, I hope that um, when I was talking about having a modular approach, that might be something that could maybe you could benefit mm. from. Um, I, so I think that's that a really important point. Good. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, actually, because not every business, you know, is having an intake of 20, 30 people every few weeks. Some people might be, you know, having dribbles of people through in the course of six months. And that's something we recognize and have, have, and have workshopped with clients and built solutions around because, and that's also one of the reasons why we have the framework that we have, because not every element of learning bed sustain, not every element of knowledge shots, skill shots and brain food is directed by a human. Utilizing LMSs and LXPs to be able to articulate the journey, but also have an element of self-directed learning in there is important. The biggest factor, and the biggest single important factor when it comes to more small intakes of, of, of people joining an organization is setting line managers up because they're gonna be the conduit to success for those people joining the business. And actually making sure that they have a line manager toolkit for onboarding. You've got somebody starting, these are some coaching questions. These are what they're going to be experiencing. This is what their plan is day by day. And not just giving them a checklist, giving them a toolkit, a playbook, which has got examples, scenarios, different ways of doing things, different ways that they can apply their learning, all aligned to this framework that we've discussed. But the line managers are going to become the single biggest element of success or failure when it comes to those smaller things. So setting them up for success is incredibly important. Giving the individuals the alignment to their journey and what that looks like is important as well. And obviously utilizing the human element of say training or L&D teams as and when it's needed. And so, so it's a great question and it's a great consideration as well. And I think also it's an iterative process you know we we can't sit here today and go this is exactly what you need to be doing like we say learning bed sustain is a framework knowledge shots brain food skill shots is a framework we then apply that and think about that and apply it in the context of the organization and it can look very different from one organization to another the cadence of regularity the strength and depth all of those other factors can take a very different shape so something great to explore and it's something exciting uh, to explore also. Any other sort of burning questions sitting around in there, Cecilia? Uh, let me check very quickly. Okay, we've got a question here from Joseph. Uh, how can our organization apply trans theoretical theory from pre-contemplating, contemplating action and maintaining learning accrued along the way and which are some of the hurdles associated with a prolonged onboarding process? There's a lot there, Joseph. There, there, there <laughs> is a lot there. Um, I'm not quite sure I understood it totally. I, uh, yeah, the trans theoretical again. theory, that was a bit of a mouthful for me to say, I, okay. I have to say. Um, but definitely we can talk about the hurdles associated with a prolonged onboarding process because I think we sort of touched on the subject already. Hmm. Uh, we see that for some jobs, especially the ones that are heavily regulated, we see hmm. very long um, onboarding programs hmm. uh, as long as five weeks or more. And, and in many cases, five weeks of, of classroom onboarding, which is a lot, a lot to hmm. take in. People go away very overwhelmed with a, with a lot of information to process. Mm. So again, it's about working with, uh, with the business to understand which are the, the biggest risks and again, mm. the drivers, and then trying to, to build it into a more manageable 
more mm. modular approach to try and focus on the ones that are more likely to to pose a risk to the business addressing those first and then thinking okay what's the likelihood of of you know what's the incidence in these um mm. and how could we uh maybe have a routing system or a different way that we can approach things just to make sure that if this is something that although there's a high risk it doesn't appear very regularly then how mm. can we identify uh, an escalation process maybe or mm. something so that people don't need to to necessarily acquire all the knowledge in one go and then realize they're not going to apply it for maybe six months so then it mm. becomes a bit of wasted um, memory space um, yeah. for learners so how can we maximize the retention by focusing on mm. the things that they're going to be handling on a, on a regular basis and yeah. then having uh, a plan should those you know risks appear having that contingency having that strategy in place but maybe not focusing on covering absolutely everything in one go absolutely really really important point um and we're clean out of time we are clean out of time we have now hit the hour um cecilia and i love talking about these things and we'd love to have some follow-up conversations we'd love to share um, some of these thoughts with you. So please do reach out to us if you want to, but we will send you a follow-up and a thank you for attending. And any of those uh, that are watching uh, the recording, um, you will also uh, be able to sort of post any questions back to us um, from the session. So thinking about onboarding 2.0, consider the framework, identify the right framework, learning bed sustain is a great place. Then think about the modalities, how you structure that program against an ever boarding, I'm gonna use that, ever boarding approach and actually never stopping on boarding through knowledge shots, brain food and skills development. And then focused on the importance of personalization. If you start to focus on the personalization of the individual's experience, amazing, but it requires some depth and thought and investment. But tomorrow we can start focusing on the personalization to roles and thinking about the skills from macro to micro and how they align. Thank you very much for taking part. Thank you for your questions. Cecilia, thank you for your insights and your thoughts. As ever, these things dash by, um, but we don't disappear when this webinar ends. Please do feel free to reach out and we look forward to continuing conversations. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lee, for having me. Thank you. Thank you.